Patrick Kashevnik is an associate professor at Tsinghua University School of Economics and Management in, uh, in Beijing. Patrick Kashevnik, thanks for joining us. Well, what's in it for Italy and what's in it for China? Well, there is a certain amount of political gamesmanship here, actually. Uh, certainly, the Italians are trying to build a market for their bonds, and they're probably talking to anybody and everybody, including the Chinese, who are interested. But from the Italian point of view, I mean, there is something of a China card here. Just like uh, Iceland, uh, when it was looking for uh, help, uh, turned to the Russians and uh, kind of posed them as, as saying, look, to, to their European neighbors, look, if, if you don't help us, the Russians will. Uh, the Italians may be doing something of that with, uh, with the Chinese. From the Chinese point of view, um, China definitely does have an interest in uh, uh, gaining market entry into, uh, I into Europe. Uh, it, it wants a couple things from Europe. It wants uh, Europe to remove the arms embargo. It wants market economy status. And if it can uh, do something to, to win favor with Europe, I mean, particularly since China is sitting on uh, massive for foreign exchange reserves, euros as well as dollars, it needs somewhere to put them. Why not claim credit for something that you're going to have to do anyway? Should the Europeans actually accept and welcome Chinese help in all this? Look, uh, China, <laughs> the interesting thing here is that, that uh, China can help, can't bail out Italy any more than the EU can. Uh, but it help, can, in the short run, help provide liquidity uh, in a market that, that seems to be seizing up and having a crisis of confidence. Over the long haul, though, what's interesting is uh, that China accumulating all these reserves and having these reserves to invest in European bonds is actually part of the problem, not part of the solution. Why does China have all these bonds? Because it's running surpluses. Or, uh, why does it have all these uh, reserves? Because it's running surpluses. Uh, why is, is, are these European countries... Uh, in the difficulty that they are. They have a growth deficit, and part of it comes from the trade deficits that they're running in China. Uh, so, so really, um, if China wants to help Europe, uh, the solution isn't to accumulate these reserves by running surpluses and then loan the proceeds back to Europe to keep it on life support. The solution really is to buy European goods, invest in Europe, help create growth in Europe. Well, you know, that's the irony here, isn't it? Uh, we could see, actually, uh, one of the reasons why Europeans need a bailout, I'm not saying it's the chief reason, is because of what you just mentioned here. So, how does it play out? It's certainly a contributing factor. I mean, fundamentally, uh, the Europeans, well, look, the Europeans right now are focused on the short-term issue of uh, can they refinance their bonds, and any help from, from any direction is probably welcome. But really, in the long term, uh, it's this rebalancing of the global economy, creating, you, turning China from uh, something that's driven by the rest of the world into a growth driver for the rest of the world. That's a significant transformation, and it's something that the Americans have been talking about, uh, and the Europeans, uh, once they get over the hump here, really need to start talking about as well. Well, that, that is just it. How do they get over the hump? Uh, is this just a case of them buying time? Part of it is, yes, the Europeans buying time. Uh, but really, uh, this, what I'm talking about, this, this transformation in terms of a rebalancing of the global economy, uh, this is really a dramatic transformation for China. And it's, it's part of you know, the report that preceded uh, me, uh, talked about uh, the investment boom that China has been uh, uh, using to drive growth. Uh, this is not a sustainable growth model. Uh, the Europeans really haven't been talking about that much. They've been focused on sort of uh, trying to get a, get a piece of, of, China, of, of the assets that China, or the, the resources that China has to, uh, uh, to pass around. But really, in the long run, they need to start talking about uh, how to turn China into a driver for, for economic growth. And that's not going to be an easy transition. Well, isn't that really what they're talking about? And uh, part of the reason why we're having this World Economic Forum is uh, to deliver quality growth, not quantitative growth. And that would play into what you just said. It's a lot of what people are talking about. Unfortunately, you don't see a lot of action behind it. Everybody in China and, and around the world recognizes that China needs to move from an export and investment-driven growth model to a domestic consumption-driven growth model and really become a growth driver for the rest of the world. But... Uh, uh, there are a couple of challenges. First, that runs up against a lot of entrenched interests in China who have benefited from the outflowing of, of, uh, of money uh, from China's lending boom uh, that's locked into the old model. 
And, uh, and really, it involves a, a transformation of China's economy. China's economy, if it was a, ch a Chinese economy that's driven by consumer growth, looks a lot different and interacts a lot differently with the outside world than the Chinese economy of today. And China has been very reluctant to, it's been, it's been open to embracing the idea in principle, but it's been very reluctant to embrace that in actual fact. And, and China's reluctance to adjust its currency is really one barometer of, of the level of discomfort that it feels in actually undertaking that transformation. Patrick, thank you so much for your time. Uh, Patrick uh, Chauvenek there with his thoughts on uh, what uh, we could be seeing out of China as it helps out uh, the Italian situation there. He's uh, from Tsinghua University.